So good morning. Sorry, we had some logistical issues this morning. They moved us at the last minute. We thought we were being, you know, when you're in family medicine, you kind of get a little paranoid. So we thought we were being preempted by like a surgical grand rounds and they just threw us over here. But actually they were being very nice. There was a, a leak in the other auditorium and they were looking out for us. So I woke up this morning feeling good just knowing that. So it's a pleasure this morning to, um, to have Richard Gottfried with us. Uh, Dick is the head of the New York State Assembly Health Committee. So for those of you who don't travel in legislative circles, um, we have an assembly and we have a Senate in New York State. Um, and we also have a governor. So the three entities together sort of um, are responsible for making our lives um, what they are today. And of the three, we are fortunate that the, the most the, the, the person for whom I, I would use the word comrade um, would be Dick Gottfried. Um, in almost every, and I won't say almost, in every issue that we've dealt with in all the years that I've been um, in healthcare, it's always Dick that I turn to for both advice about um, how to deal with particular issues that we're struggling with, whether they're financial issues or policy issues or you know, laws about that regulate the things that we do, um, but also to listen to his wisdom about how things work and how to get things done in Albany, which is um, a skill in and of itself. So Dick represents the 75th Assembly District, which covers Chelsea, Hell's Kitchen, Murray Hill, Midtown, and part of the Lincoln Center area in Manhattan. He's been chair of the Assembly Health Committee since 1987. He was a major architect of New York's landmark managed care reforms and continues to fight for stronger protections for consumers and health care providers and public support for universal access to quality affordable health care. The highlights of his legislative work include the passage of the Prenatal Care Assistance Program for low-income women, the Child Health Plus Program, which allows low and moderate income parents to get free or low cost health insurance for their kids. The law that gives patients access to information about a doctor's background and their malpractice record. Family Health Plus, which provides free health coverage for low income adults. The health care proxy law, which allows people to designate an agent to make health care decisions for them if they lose decision making capacity the HIV testing and confidentiality law, and laws that promote stronger primary and preventive care. In the legislature, he's been the leading proponent of patient autonomy, especially in end-of-life care and reproductive freedom. He also, and probably the most important thing now, is that he is the sponsor of New York Health Bill, which will create a universal publicly funded single-payer health coverage plan for New York State. And um, you can see you're in a friendly crowd here. And, um, and, and he was first elected to the assembly in 1970 at the age of 23 while a student at Columbia Law School. Um, just a, a fun fact. But, but Dick, you know, we're, we're, as you can tell, supporters of single payer. Anybody that works in healthcare and has to deal with the things that we do, and I had the advantage of, of, um, of being able to testify at a hearing that Dick led on single payer last year, and it passed the assembly. So we just have one more hurdle, the, you know, which is the state senate, which we should be able to get through this year, and, um, and then we'll just beat up the governor until he says yes. So um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dick Gottfried. Well, good morning. So I, th there's this little smaller than postage stamp size uh, thing on the screen here that shows my face. And Neil tells me I have to stand in just the right place so that it's, my face stays in there. Otherwise, the people watching this on video uh, we'll just see the wooden paneling behind me. Um, so pardon me if I'm occasionally distracted. Um, so it's hard to, 
think of anybody I'd rather be introduced by uh, than my friend Neil Kalman. Um, you know, Neil uh, talks about you know me being helpful to him, which I'm happy to hear. Um, but you know, part of the reality of the legislature is that uh, we really depend. Some of us are more aware of it than others. Uh, on people like Neil, people like yourselves, uh, in what I sometimes call the real world, uh, to let us know uh, what we need to do, to let us know, uh, you know what we've done that is messing something up or what we haven't done that uh, we ought to do to make things work. Um, you know, we all live our, our, our daily lives uh, involved in a lot of things. Uh, in the 46 years that I've been in the New York State Legislature, we have never had among our members a physician, uh, which is interesting because I know there are a lot of other states, and I, I, I work with legislators in other states. There are quite a few physicians elected to legislatures around the state. Uh, for some reason, we have never had a physician in the New York Legislature. We've had uh, several RNs, we've had uh, uh, a couple of dentists, a couple of pharmacists, uh, a veterinarian or two, um, a couple of uh, funeral directors, um, you know, who I, I guess are, are a little late to the scene to be called healthcare providers, but you know, they deal with bodies, um, but never a physician. And, uh, you know, I, I, I talk frequently with groups of medical students and, uh, uh, and residents about uh, how they can and should be involved in, uh, in, in public policy. And it is enormously important, uh, whether it's through, uh, you know, associations that you belong to or the places where you work that may have a, uh, you know, periodic uh, lobbying efforts. Um, you can also do what, uh, what my friend uh, Lou Cooper uh, did. Uh, Lou, uh, who I guess is now pretty much retired, uh, was for several years the head of the pediatricians here in New York. And Lou arranged it so that he lived uh, a block away from me um, and walked his dog at a certain time in the morning when I was likely to be walking to the subway, and so he would bend my ear. Uh, and he also arranged to have not one but two daughters uh, who in succession as they grew up babysat for my son. Um, and so, you know, they are both now, by the way, pediatricians. Uh, so Lou got to talk to me a lot. Uh, and anytime he missed me while walking his dog, uh, you know, he would call. Um, so you can't all live next door to your assembly member, uh, but every New Yorker, if they put their mind to it, has the opportunity uh, to write, to call, to, to meet at meetings uh, with your legislators to let us know what is going on in healthcare uh, that we need to know about. Um, so what are some of my thoughts for this morning? Um, you know, back in the 1780s, when we were putting this country together, uh, here in New York, uh, we had the good sense to uh, uh, adopt the notion of free universal uh, elementary and secondary schools. Uh, the folks in Congress, even before the Constitution was adopted, uh, put provision for free uh, public schools in the Northwest Ordinance. Uh, so that the folks out in what we now call the Midwest uh, would have schools for their kids. Uh, in 1862, at the depths of the Civil War, uh, Congress had the good sense to provide through the, uh, the land-grant system for, uh, uh, for public higher education in this country. Uh, ben Franklin had the foresight to think we should have a uh, publicly run uh, uh, postal service, and, you know, we put our minds to having the government do canals and bridges and stuff like that. And even back in the Middle Ages, uh, government understood that there were 
were things the government need to do to take care of the frail elderly and uh, paupers and the like. Um, but in the 1780s, what was health care? Health care was, I don't know, leeches and uh, people with really ugly, bloody, rusty hacksaws. Um, not particularly expensive, uh, not particularly effective. Uh, it never seems to have occurred to Ben Franklin uh, or Alexander Hamilton that uh, among the things they thought the government should be involved with uh, was health care. Uh, and then after the Civil War comes the Gilded Age and America goes into uh, sort of arrested development uh, in terms of social policy. And while in much of the rest of the world, uh, governments came to recognize that healthcare uh, was a public responsibility, maybe linked to uh, our inalienable right to life even, um, but that didn't really happen here. Um, and as a result, uh, our healthcare system uh, is almost entirely uh, uh, tied uh, to health insurance companies. And I have long believed that virtually every problem that we face in health or healthcare is made worse and made harder and more expensive to solve. Uh, because of the fact that our healthcare system is so rooted in, in health insurance companies. And that's true whether you are a patient, whether you're a, a healthcare provider, whether you are an employer, a taxpayer. Uh, and, you know, the Affordable Care Act uh, made a lot of improvements in, in health insurance. Uh, it has some of its improvements were less important here in New York because, for example, laws about pre-existing conditions and whatnot uh, and community rating we had enacted uh, back in the 1990s in New York. Uh, people tend to forget that, but um, uh, nonetheless, the ACA has done a, a, a lot of good. There are a lot of New Yorkers who now have health coverage who didn't uh, beforehand. Uh, in New York, we've done a much better job of implementing the ACA than I think any other state. Um, but the fundamental problem with the ACA is that it leaves us in the hands of insurance companies. Uh, and that means uh, rising premiums. Uh, it means uh, more and more people have health plans uh, with deductibles, and those deductibles uh, are rising even faster than the premiums. Uh, and so you have a lot of people saying, you know, I've got, I, I have health coverage, but now I've discovered I can't afford to use it. Uh, not only rising deductibles, but copays. Every plan on the New York State Exchange, and almost every plan even that isn't on the New York Exchange, uh, has a restricted provider network. Uh, many of which, most of which, uh, pay nothing if you go out of network. Um, as a New York public employee, uh, my coverage has a, uh, a restricted provider network. It, it doesn't pay zero if you go out of network. Um, I, I recently had a, a, a wisdom tooth pulled. Uh, my dentist sent me to a very fine oral surgeon who did a really wonderful job. It, it's almost embarrassing how, how little it hurt. Um, I guess drugs uh, are, you know, kind of amazing. Um, and I'm not talking opioids, um, uh, although he did give me uh, a prescription for a handful of those, but I tried one and I said, no, this is not a good idea. Um, uh, but, you know, good old nitrous oxide is really amazing stuff. Um, uh, and ibuprofen does pretty well. Um, I digress. Um, so because he is out of network with my dental plan, uh, his bill was $1,200. I was happily uh, uh, able to pay, uh, not as able to pay as some of my constituents, but you know. Um, my public employee health plan did not leave me totally in the lurch. They paid $56. Uh, 
And I'm sure there is a dentist in Manhattan whose usual and customary charge is $56. I am quite sure that I would not want me or any of my constituents uh, going to that dentist. But, you know, it, at least I had some out-of-network benefit. But what this means for, for New Yorkers, and, and by the way, that's uh, on top of that, you have your health plan not only telling you uh, what doctors and hospitals uh, they will pay for you to go to, but of course also what treatments uh, uh, they will allow you to get coverage for. Um, but what all of that means uh, is that for millions of New Yorkers, uh, their health plan and the fact that we are so dependent on health plans uh, is the major obstacle standing between them and the health care that they need. Uh, it is sometimes a major obstacle between them and being able to stay alive. Uh, it is a major obstacle between them uh, and family financial stability. Uh, the about a quarter of every dollar we spend on, uh, on health coverage uh, goes either to pay for the administrative and uh, administrative costs and profit of health insurance companies, and about as much also goes to pay for the administrative costs that doctors and hospitals incur uh, largely to fight with insurance companies. So none of that has really anything to do with, uh, with health care. Uh, it has to do with insurance companies doing their, their best uh, to not have to spend their stockholders or their executives' money on our health care and efforts by our doctors and hospitals uh, to try to get money out of uh, our insurance companies so that they can take care of us. Uh, that's an enormous amount of money. Uh, a quarter, I mean, we spend about, uh, well, it'll soon be uh, about $280, $290 billion a year in New York on, on health care. Uh, spending, you know, a quarter of that is like 70, getting to, to like $70 billion. Uh, and then on top of that, there is the money that New Yorkers spend out of pocket uh, on deductibles and co-pays and out-of-network uh, charges. You know, for a, a you know, typical family health coverage now costs like seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000 a year. Uh, in a city where the median household income uh, is, I don't know, about sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year. And again, that's for the coverage, that doesn't count uh, out-of-pocket expenses. Uh, now, for some New Yorkers, that's no big deal. Uh, you know, Hermes sells uh, leather shoulder bags for about thirteen, fourteen uh, hundred dollars. Um, there are uh, women in in my district who own uh, one of them in every color, uh, and so for their households. You know, a, a three or four thousand dollar deductible, a seventeen thousand uh, uh, dollar health insurance premium, uh, you know, is uh, is not a significant uh, factor. Uh, but for the vast majority of New Yorkers, uh, it's a major problem. Uh, now, fortunately, it does not have to be that way. Uh, as we learned in the 1780s with with education. And as our neighbors to the north learned uh, 45 or more years ago uh, with health care, um, as the people of Taiwan figured out about 20 years ago, um, and several other countries, uh, health care can be paid for by the public, and that money can be raised not through premiums and deductibles and copays uh, that are about the most regressive form of taxation you could imagine because the healthcare, health insurance companies want the same $17,000 uh, 
whether that's like your entire uh, annual income or, or half of your annual income or a third of it, or like some people we could name, uh, one thousandth or half of a thousandth uh, of your annual income, they want the same premium and they want you to pay uh, the same deductible. Again, about as regressive a way to pay for something as you could imagine. Instead, uh, health care could be paid for uh, through uh, uh, a public system where the funding would be raised uh, based on ability to pay. Um, by the way, I, because my daughter-in-law is from Taiwan, I, I, I know a little more about Taiwanese politics than probably most of you know. Um, you know, after Chiang Kai-shek died, uh, his right-wing party, the, the Guomindang, uh, stayed in power for a number of years. Um, they, you know, figured out they had to hold elections and things like that. Um, their single-payer system in Taiwan was enacted not under the, under the Democratic uh, Progressive Party, which is their center-left party. It was enacted while the Guomindang was in power uh, in 1996. So it was their, their center-right party that enacted uh, their, uh, their single-payer system. Um, I don't know that that's going to happen here, um, where we, I, some would say we have two center-right parties. Um, but it, so it doesn't have to be the way, uh, the way we pay for coverage in New York. And yes, a single-payer system is undoubtedly a long uphill path uh, if you're talking about the federal uh, government. Uh, Congress in Washington is a long way uh, from, I think, from taking this up uh, uh, seriously. But, you know, we live in a country of uh, 50 states, which uh, are often called the laboratories of democracy. Uh, our states often are way out ahead of uh, the federal government. Uh, in 1799, uh, which was many years before, 171 years uh, before I was elected to the assembly, um, the New York legislature abolished slavery. Uh, it took 28 years to implement, but you know we were on the right path. We were the first state uh, to, to vote to abolish slavery. Uh, we took the lead in minimum wage laws and uh, the 40-hour week and child labor laws and workplace safety and, and a whole host of, uh, uh, of things. So the States can take the lead. Um, the child health insurance program that uh, was enacted by the federal government in 96, uh, 97, uh, began in Minnesota uh, in, around, in the late 1980s. We in New York plagiarized it from them in, uh, in 1990. Um, and, uh, and, and the federal government uh, uh, under Bill Clinton eventually figured out that uh, we could take cigarette tax revenue federally and, uh, and pay for that. Um, so the states can take the lead, and New York, uh, you know, likes to, many people like to call us the progressive capital of the country, um, and, uh, and in many ways uh, I am delighted that we are. Um, the, the New York Health Act, uh, my bill to set up a single-payer system in New York. Uh, I first introduced it in uh, 1992. Uh, it actually passed the assembly that year. You, you may remember that there was a whole lot of national interest in universal coverage. Uh, Harris Wofford got elected to the U.S. Senate from Pennsylvania on that platform. Uh, that led to the, uh, the Clinton administration doing the, the Clinton health plan. Um, but after 92, it never got to the floor of the state assembly again uh, until last year. And in May of last year, we got it to the floor. It passed by a, about a two to one margin. Uh, and we're planning on doing that again this year. Um, what changed? Uh, a couple of things. Number one, uh, for the labor movement, uh, healthcare is becoming 
increasingly not something that unions are thrilled to be providing to their members and labor leaders regard it as, you know, one of the great reasons why people, uh, you know, vote to reelect them as head of the union because they're so happy about the health plan. All of that is true, but sustaining the union health plan for almost every union is becoming increasingly a major threat to their existence uh, and a major threat to collective bargaining because at the bargaining table, practically every ounce of effort goes into a uh, basically retreating battle uh, to protect the union health plan. Uh, and every, you know, contract cycle, uh, deductibles go up, copays go up, the drug benefit shrinks, uh, restrictive networks get tighter, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so there has been a, a real surge in, uh, in support for the New York Health Act uh, from progressive labor unions. Uh, it's supported by the New York State Nurses Association, which actually they were on board with single payer uh, before I was. They were one of the groups that explained the concept to me and sold me on the idea. Uh, 1199, uh, uh, the New York State United Teachers, the UFT, uh, 32BJ, the union that represents building service employees, the, uh, the UAW, the communication workers, the, uh, uh, the various retail worker unions, uh, and, and a whole bunch more uh, are very strongly uh, supporting the bill, and actually they're backing that up uh, with actual uh, really hefty uh, donations to the, the campaign uh, uh, to support the bill. Um, part of what has created increased interest in the single-payer bill uh, is the Affordable Care Act. And, uh, I'm, and I say that not because there are people who are cranky about uh, various aspects of it. There, there certainly are. Um, but, you know, for many years people said, gee, you know, we, we like your single-payer idea, but maybe we should try something like what Massachusetts did, you know, see if that helps. Well, the Affordable Care Act basically is what Massachusetts did, and yes, it's made a lot of things better, uh, but it has uh, really left us with a, with a host of problems, and a lot of people now say, well, you know, Dick, I guess you're right. Uh, single-payer is really the only uh, intelligent way to, to do it, to do uh, paying for health care. Um, but so many people who say that then say, but of course it could never happen. Uh, here in New York we are changing that conversation. Uh, here in New York uh, with the surge in labor union support, with increased uh, public uh, uh, support for it, uh, now that the assembly has uh, uh, has, has passed the bill uh, with an overwhelming vote, uh, there are more and more people who are saying, you know, maybe the, this is something we could do here in New York. And I think as more people think that, more people are going to start asking their candidates for the state Senate, uh, so where are you on this issue and how come the state Senate uh, hasn't passed this bill? And I really believe that as more people start asking that of their candidates, it progresses from something that we really could do uh, to something that becomes almost inevitable. Um, so let's talk a little about where uh, the healthcare provider world is. Um, you know, the State Medical Society uh, has certainly not come on board. Uh, even though apparently they did a survey a year ago that found that something like two-thirds of their members uh, support single-payer. Uh, well, maybe it's not two-thirds of their members. It was, I guess, two-thirds of, of physicians in New York uh, support single-payer. As, as you probably know, uh, the Medical Society's membership is a small and skewed sample of, of, of physicians in New York. Um, uh, the various hospital trade associations in New York uh, have not come on board. Uh, I think they're a large part of their concern. Uh, I mean, uh, hospital associations, as you may know, uh, are heavily dominated by uh, 
places like where we are, uh, the major academic uh, medical centers who uh, look at the marketplace and say, you know, we've got the clout to get a lot of money out of insurance companies. Uh, you know, why would we want to uh, upset that apple cart? Um, and by the way, will you pay us for graduate medical education? Um, and uh, the answer to those questions is, first of all, on GME, easy question, yes, even though 20 years ago New York stopped requiring health insurance companies uh, to pay for graduate medical education, uh, which New York did against my advice. Um, uh, the Medicaid program does continue to pay uh, and is required to pay uh, for GME, and under the New York Health Act, uh, the New York Health Act would be paying for GME on behalf of all 20 million uh, New Yorkers. Uh, the healthcare providers, doctors, hospitals are concerned, you know, if there's going to be this one big payer in the sky, uh, how are we going to get paid? A um, couple of answers to that. Number one, uh, the bill uh, has language that would authorize health care providers to band together in collective organizations uh, to negotiate with the New York Health Act. Uh, you might say, why do we need a law to do that? Is, and the answer is, well, if you're not part of one uh, corporate entity, if you try to bargain with somebody, uh, you, it is regarded as a conspiracy in restraint of trade unless you are doing it under uh, state statutory authorization, and the bill would, would do that. Uh, but much more important, I believe, is the fact that under the New York Health Act, uh, we would all be in the same boat. And the, that means that if the, the one-tenth of one percent of New Yorkers, if the wealthy and powerful New Yorkers want their doctors and hospitals well paid for, and they certainly do, and they have the clout to make sure that that happens, since the New York Health Act uh, would be setting rates, et cetera, uh, across the board, not that every provider would be paid exactly the same, but uh, there would be a uniform system. Uh, my doctor and my constituent's doctor uh, would, be, would be benefiting from the fact that we and they are in the same boat with George Soros and George Soros's doctor. Um, to me, that is by far the best guarantee uh, of, of the quality of the benefits and of the quality of the, of the payment methodologies and rates uh, that anyone could ask for and a whole lot better guarantee uh, than almost anything, uh, not only than almost anything you can imagine, I don't know that there is a system other than perhaps, you know, restricting your practice to uh, uh, the, the, the one percent of society, which there are some practitioners who do, um, I don't know that there's any other mechanism uh, you could design uh, that would have that effect. Um, so that, that all-in-one boat factor, I think, is really pretty critically important. Um, saving maybe the best for last, um, there are two very important organizations in, of healthcare providers, uh, uh, in addition to the, to the nurses and uh, uh, the Committee of Interns and Residents and the, the Doctors' Council, which represents the uh, physicians in the Health and Hospitals Corporation. Uh, the state organizations of the pediatricians and the family practice physicians uh, have both uh, uh, strongly endorsed uh, the New York Health Act, um, uh, which certainly reassures me um, that we're on the right path. Um, so what we need to do to get this enacted is talk about it a lot more, bring more of the healthcare world on board, bring more rank-and-file New Yorkers on board, and we're 
working to get that, that word out. Uh, as Bill Perkins, who is the Senate sponsor of the bill, uh, likes to say that, you know, to get it passed uh, in the state Senate, we're going to need to either change some minds or change some personnel. Uh, and actually, I think as the single payer concept uh, becomes more real in the minds of more New Yorkers, I think that's going to be a major factor in changing minds or personnel uh, in the state Senate. Uh, and so with, with your activism and support, uh, I think this is something we can, we can really achieve for New York. Thank you. And Neil, I'm, I'll, I'll take questions and you tell me when I've uh, eaten up the time. Okay. So how do we get from here to there? What happens to all the insurance companies? Um, and I think the thing that people feel is so impractical is we have such a huge um, economy that's built around these insurers and everything. Like, what happens to all of these people? And how do we get, what, what happens on the day it gets enacted? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, the economic analysis that we've had done about the plan uh, done by uh, the chair of the economics department at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, uh, shows that uh, the savings from enacting the New York Health Act would be about $71 billion a year, largely by eliminating insurance company and health care provider administrative costs, uh, more effective uh, bargaining with, uh, with drug companies, um, more effective uh, policing of fraud, uh, et cetera. That would be balanced by increased spending on uh, raising provider rates, covering the uninsured, uh, the plan picking up what people now pay for out-of-pocket costs. The net savings to New Yorkers would be $45 billion a year, which is over $2,000 for every man, woman, and child. So putting that $45 billion back into the pockets of New York uh, consumers and, and employers uh, is going to lead to the creation of, uh, the analysis showed, uh, to the creation of about uh, 200,000 new jobs. Now, the health insurance industry employs in New York uh, 23,000 people. Um, for most of those people, it's, I mean, there is a very high rate of turnover, and so for most of those people, it is a job they have for a couple of years, and then they, I guess, decide that there's something else they want to do. Um, it is an industry, as I said, whose main function, uh, I mean, it's not what, the, what those 23,000 people mean to do, but it is the main function of their work is to stand between uh, us and health care and financial stability. Uh, I don't think we should sustain uh, that kind of system uh, because of the jobs involved. I don't think that's the kind of jobs program uh, we would want. Uh, the New York Health Act does provide uh, that a slice of its revenue could be used for uh, training and, and, and relocation, et cetera, uh, to the extent needed. But the health insurance industry would basically find something else to uh, invest its money in uh, other than keep standing between us and health care. Uh, it would be illegal under the bill uh, to sell insurance that would duplicate uh, the benefits of the New York Health Act. I want to thank you for coming to talk to us and for championing this. But my understanding is that our neighboring state, Vermont, tried to do a single-payer system and it, and it didn't work out. Can you talk a little bit about that? What what happened in Vermont? Yeah. And how would your plan? What what are the lessons for for your plan that w would avoid those problems? Yeah. Uh, Two things about what they did in Vermont. One is that uh, their plan, as I understand it, 
uh, excluded uh, multi-state corporations. Uh, I don't know whether it's because they thought they, they would have a hard time doing that, I don't know. Um, but as a result of that, uh, of, of significantly narrowing uh, you know, the scope of the plan, uh, they lost a lot of the savings that would come uh, from a single payer system, uh, in, including that healthcare providers would still have to have you know, a hefty administrative expense to deal with the health plans serving those multi-state uh, corporations. So they, they lose a lot of the savings and they lost a lot of the revenue because a lot of you know, multi-state corporations were among their highest paying or are among their highest paying employers. Um, the other major problem is that you know, Vermont's economy uh, has much to be said for it, but it is basically nowhere near the wealth generator that the New York economy is. Uh, the New York state economy, uh, largely thanks to Lower Manhattan, is the greatest generator of wealth uh, the world knows and, and has ever known. Um, and as a result, while raising, while Vermont, because of the narrow scope of their plan and because of the small size of their wealth generating economy, uh, felt they would have had to impose a much higher percentage rate uh, of taxation than New York will need to do uh, for the premiums that we will set. Uh, premiums is the word we use. It would be levied on, on payroll income and, uh, and non-payroll income like uh, taxable uh, interest, dividends, and capital gains. Uh, progressively graduated based on ability to pay, the, the rates that we would be looking at in New York would be dramatically lower uh, than what they were looking at in, in Vermont. And uh, by the way, 98% of New York households would be paying less uh, under the New York Health Act, uh, in most cases dramatically less uh, than we're paying now for premiums and deductibles and other out-of-pocket costs. So the, what we are doing different from Vermont is number one, we're New York and we have New York's economy as our revenue generating base. And number two, we are, what we would be doing is a, a full blown uh, single payer system, not a, restrict, not a narrowly restricted system. So while the mic's getting passed, just uh, so people have some sense of this, the Institute for Family Health pays $1.5 million just for staff that bill 40 or 50 different carriers and credential doctors to every single one of these plans. So it costs us, you know, almost 2% of our entire revenue goes just to dealing with, uh, with the billing of all these health plans. So and, count and, that, you can add that to your list of savings. Well, uh, well actually, uh, the analysis does say that we include that we would be saving New York employers about $2 billion uh, a year in the, and again, that's not the premiums that they pay, it's the administrative cost of dealing exactly. with, with, with the health benefit. Um, a number that most of us never think of, except, of course, employers think of it. Uh, it costs an awful lot of money, you know, to pick a health plan, to deal with the health plans, people, et cetera, et cetera, in the human resources department of the, of the employer. Yeah. So as I'm sure you're well aware, under our current system, um, there's an incredibly tiered, some might even say segregated level of care um, where my patient with Medicaid has to wait longer to see a specialist, um, you know, is, has to only see a less experienced physician, even has to go to a different physical facility, yep. um, even in fine institutions like the one in which you stand now. Um, so my question is, I, I know that in other countries that have single payer, the wealthier individuals are able to buy private insurance and kind of have access to more concierge services. Are there going to be provisions in this bill to prevent hospitals um, from kind of catering to those individuals and hopefully making care more equitable to everyone? Yeah. Um, I think it is, it is 
very important to the bill that people would not be allowed to sell coverage that covers the things that the New York Health Act covers. Um, now, what that means is that you know, if, if somebody wants to sell you insurance that will pay for a private room in a hospital that isn't clinically indicated, because uh, if it is clinically indicated, we'd pay for it, uh, you could buy coverage for that. You could certainly buy coverage for uh, uh, cosmetic surgery that isn't uh, clinically uh, uh, based, um, although I don't know if any, I can't imagine that somebody who actually regard that as an insurable uh, event. Um, no, because it's, it's an entirely volitional expenditure. Um, uh, but also the bill, and, and that's important as part of keeping everyone in the same boat, the bill would bar health care providers <clears throat> if they accept money from the New York Health Act from balance billing a patient. And again, that's also part of making sure that uh, that wealthy New Yorkers have a, have a vested interest in keeping the plan at a high level. Um, the bill does not bar a provider from saying, I'm going to skip uh, New York Health Act money entirely. Uh, patient, you and I, you'll just pay me money. Um, I don't know whether, I mean, it would be, a, I think a, a tough sell constitutionally uh, to go that far. Um, I think there, you know, given how, what a thin slice of society that population would be, there would be a very limited number of healthcare providers that could earn their living catering exclusively to that population. Um, an awful lot of them have offices within a few blocks of right here, um, at least if you head downtown. Um, so that's what, what, what the bill would do. Um, and a, a, a lot of people ask, well, gee, you know, why shouldn't I be able to buy extra health coverage if I can afford it? And the answer is because we need you in the same boat. Uh, you know, if you could buy uh, separate insurance uh, for the fire department to come, uh, the amount of money New York pays to maintain the fire department would really plummet. Um, uh, and, and so that, I, I think, is really crucial uh, to the bill. Um, and I think, you know, there's a... Back when New York regulated hospital prices, uh, which we... which sunsetted in 1996, again, against my advice, um, Blue Cross in those days, or up till shortly before those days, was like the overwhelmingly only insurance company to, worth talking about in New York. The Blue Cross hospital rate was statutorily linked to the Medicaid hospital rate as being equal. And as a result, while Medicaid was paying like seven or ten dollars for a doctor office visit, Medicaid was paying hospitals a good price. Why? Because the hospitals needed the Medicaid rate to be high so that all of their other patients' rate would be as high. And that kept the Medicaid price to hospitals uh, at a really high level. And then in 96, when we broke that link, uh, then the two rates very quickly started uh, to separate. Um, and so th that history, I think, really demonstrates the, the importance of, of, of linking us all, having us all in the same boat. This is, <clears throat> this is great. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the benefit package itself yep. and knowing that more and more we're dealing especially with social determinants of health the ways in which especially behavioral health becomes more important obviously dealing with addiction yeah um, oral health being another issue that you know wasn't even mentioned in the ACA and knowing how important that is and sort of what's the what's the bill's approach to 
designing and evaluating the benefit package itself. Yep. Uh, the, the bill says, first off, that, that every benefit that is covered by any one of the following would be available to every New York Health Act enrollee. Uh, Medicaid, uh, Child Health Plus, uh, Medicare, uh, the mandated benefits under the New York Insurance Law, and the state employee health care package, uh, health benefit package. So any service covered by any one of those would be covered by the New York Health Act. Um, uh, I don't know any, uh, you know, health care service that, is, uh, that, that, that has a medical justification as opposed to purely cosmetic surgery uh, that isn't going to fall in at least one of those. Um, and again, the, uh, and then in addition to that, uh, the plan would be authorized to, to add uh, to that list of benefits. Um, the plan uh, is intended to cover long-term care. Uh, it would not cover long-term care off the bat. Uh, the bill directs the, the program to develop a a proposal for covering long-term care and, and to submit that to the legislature. There are a variety of reasons that make covering long-term care a more complicated thing than covering uh, the rest of health care. You know, from the viewpoint of primary and preventive care and behavioral health, uh, one of the advantages of a, of a single-payer system is that it it would be run by folks who are publicly accountable and get up in the morning concerned about the public interest, not their stockholders. And so if we make a public policy decision, as, as we would, that primary and preventive care and behavioral health are things that we need to invest in uh, and invest more in, the New York Health Act would be able to do that a lot more quickly and a lot more effectively than getting dozens and dozens of insurance companies uh, to figure that out. You know, part of the problem with insurance companies investing in benefits that, that make sense in the long run is that insurance companies look at a patient and say, if I spend a lot of money keeping you healthy today, five years from now, when, when that starts to, you know, produce benefits back to a carrier because you'll be healthier, uh, you will have you know, gone to work for another company, you'll be covered by a different insurance company, they will reap the benefit of your health that we paid to create. So trying to convince insurance companies uh, that they should invest now in keeping us healthy in the future uh, really doesn't work very well but with a single-payer system, the people who run the plan would know that five or ten years from now, yeah, you'll be under the New York Health Act, and it's in our long-range interest uh, to keep you healthy. We're going to have to stop, it, but uh, um, it would be great if you could just hang around for a few minutes. I know yeah. there's people with additional mm -hmm. questions. So I, I just want to thank you for being a champion of this and know that all of us um, support you, and just tell us what you need us to do. You know, bus to Albany on the right day or whatever, and um, we're prepared to uh, to take our position and and make it known to the folks in Albany. Well, there is a, a lobby day with buses uh, on May 24th. Uh, if you Google uh, the campaign for New York Health and go to their website, you can find out uh, do it. how to find the uh, uh, the buses to Albany, and that would be great. We'll give it a shot. Thank you. Thank you.